We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is John Forrest Little, publisher of The Pickaxe. How are you today, John? I'm doing great, Tom. It's great to talk to you. I feel like I only have you as this sort of companion when I'm banished to the basement (laughs) to listen to podcasts. My wife says, no more financial news. It's stressing you out and me out. So... I have to do this like in the closet, so to speak. It's good. To, it's my honor to be here. And I will say that only alternative and independent media is the only media I consume. So I consider you a leader in that space and you're doing a great service to me and our friends listening today. So thank you. Well, I, I appreciate that kind feedback. And, you know, that's that's my my only real goal with this show is to provide all of those that are listening with some some valuable information and insight that we can't necessarily get anywhere else. So I, I wanted to start today, you know, you you write a, a lot of articles over on the, the pickaxe.xyz. Maybe we can start today by talking a little bit about the the bifurcation that you're starting to see in the world into into two teams, if you could. Certainly. I sort of set up a metaphor that if there was a Super Bowl game being played, people would be betting the game and handicapping the game. And in the past, when the U.S. either had, after World War I and World War II, when we were able to ship so many things over to Europe and assist in those wars, we received what the French president called the exorbitant advantage of having everyone's gold um, winning those two wars back to back. And then things got wacky when um, Kissinger met with the Saudis and we decoupled the dollar to gold to pay for adventures in Vietnam. And there's been 57 wars since World War II. And, you know, they're undeclared wars. And that's why, you know, the media doesn't speak of them. But every time we're in one, Um, Vietnam was a disaster. They've all been disasters. Iraq, uh, recently Afghanistan, we saw that we replaced the Taliban with the Taliban, with this sort of what we thought was a minor country, but it had, of course, opium. Um, And that war was $2.3 trillion, according to the Watson Institute, um, which is the University of, or Brown University five times the price of Vietnam. So since we're seeing the US dollar basically at risk because we've been printing so much, but I'm not the only one seeing that, you're not the only one seeing that, your viewers aren't either. Um, China and Russia have taken a really hard look at what's happened, especially since the great financial collapse of 2008 which is this enormous infusion of, you know, printing effort or mouse click money or what we call quantitative easing. And now I think we're in round four or five. It's hard to keep track. But every time we roll out a new uh, TARP or CARES Act, or today they were talking about chips, which is sort of a backdoor bailout for the uh, semiconductor industry, Every time that happens, you're chipping away at the legitimacy of the dollar. And meanwhile, what's going on? Let's look at the situation in Ukraine. Um, I don't understand the sanctions. And I wrote that as one of the six signs that the dollar is toast, because at that point, it just pushed Russia into China's arms. But there's been more reporting that is even more significant, starting with a bunch of Eastern European countries, starting with Germany, actually repatriating their gold. And that was followed by a bunch of central banks like uh, Austria doing the same thing, Poland, Hungary, um, the Bank of, or the Dutch National Bank, Bank of Austria. And that was a huge impact. And I started thinking that that was a story that was unreported. It happened in around 2019. 
And then miles uh, signpost number two would be something like uh, the the Belt and Road Initiative in China, where China has connected 75% of the world's population through Eastern or through Europe, excuse me, yeah, parts of Europe, Asia and Africa, connecting their roads, bridges, railroads and maritime, you know, channels. And this is again, crickets in the United States media, no reporting whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And China did a good job of sort of taking the playbook from the United States and the IMF using what we call debt trap financing which is a great little insidious way to over loans uh, an emerging markets some money. And then on page 85, somewhere in the fine print, if you, you give them too much and if they can't pay it back, then you come back in and you have the rights to their land, labor, capital. And then after the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the major unraveling of the United States dollar has been now Saudi has signed a deal wanting Russian protection. So that was our trick after um, the gold window closed was at least to have the petrodollar. That way, every other country would have to transact or hold dollars to buy oil. But now that Saudi has signed up with Russia, again, no reporting in the local media, none whatsoever. Uh, Nigeria did the same thing. And now it's all set up to where these countries can now trade with each other due to the last shock being, I call it the six positions on the dice, the six nails in the coffin, um, sort of the six, 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 you know, US dollar is toast because they now are transacting in gold to get around sanctions. Okay. And using gold as it's intended to be used, it's fungible, it's divisible. Um, no one trusts another government. I mean, Russia doesn't necessarily trust China, but they're partners together to face the common foe of the United States. But it's wonderful that they're using gold as it's intended to be used when two nations don't trust each other. They can at least trust the $3,000 history or 3,000 year history of gold. And then it's convertible in the, in the, in the yawn. So, Beautiful. John, are they are they actually using it to transact, or are they just using it kind of as a as a backing or or trust mechanism between their currencies? I think the understanding is that they have gold. China has way more gold than anyone knows about, way more than twenty thousand tons. Alistair McLeod's done a great job of of documenting that, as well as. I forgot, Ronan Manley. Um, there's a lot of data on it. Same with Russia. And then if you look at who's producing most of the gold, it's China, Russia, South Africa, all the nations that are in BRICS. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason, you know, you first start off, you know, repatriating your gold. Then you start trading each other energy for gold and then settling. And yeah, I think there is evidence that they're using gold. You know, are they going to come out and you have to do your own due diligence um, but certainly uh, no nation, UK has been selling gold. The United States has been, our, our central banks never talk about gold. Theirs do. Um, they're the gold producers and we're the gold suppressors. The LBMA and the COMEX are, have lost legitimacy and are known for, I mean, we get our paper price or a derivative is a financial instrument that derives value from an underlying asset. So why would we use a paper price that trades 10 to 20 times of mining activity in a year, in a week on the, you know, on the U.S. system? And the Saudis right now are doing are really starting to see, is this also going on with the oil market? Doomberg wrote about that um, recently, that the West is starting and their shenanigans are becoming discovered by people that are keeping a watchful eye on this sort of manipulation. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of go back to that idea of the, the bifurcation of the world into two teams, we really have the West and then the BRICS nations who comprise, what was it, 75% of the world population and 50% of its GDP? Right, that's right. So they, they, on that 50% number, that's you know pre-industrialization. So if you take a country like Russia, you know, Doug Casey, he's a genius, but he'll say sort of derogatory things like, well, it's just a big wheat field and 
a gas station with a store next to it that sells guns. What he's trying to say is that they don't add value to a lot of their commodities. So, but it's still good, especially as we see depletion and an environment of depletion. It's great to have the coal, the gas, the oil, the nickel, the aluminum, the wheat. So I, I understand what he's saying, but someone will figure out a way to, India is usually the one that comes in there and adds value mm -hmm. in China. And, and what do you mean by add value, John? I mean by taking um, raw materials take and turning them into finished goods. Mm -hmm. And the final way to add value is to add some marketing angle to it so, or intellectual property patents. Mm -hmm. So do you think that this is going to lead to a new Bretton Woods agreement and or a new type of currency for these countries to transact in that is going to exclude the West? It won't exclude the West, but it puts it takes the West monopoly away, which will have this. And if the West stays in denial and just thinks that the military is its only or the Ministry of Propaganda are their only two tools, um, now we're in chase mode. So I would say that if we have a new Bretton Woods, which people like Zoltan Polzar and other brilliant minds have been hinting towards, that you know people are dropping that dollar like a hot potato because they're not needing to hold dollars to buy oil any longer. And everything is going to come down to who can get their hands on oil. That's why it was such a big, um, dramatic sea change to see Saudi Arabia and Nigeria within the same week sign up with Russia. It's not like Russia was going to say, uh, you, you can also work with the United States. I mean, the, you know, if I wanted to be a distributor for Palisade Gold's radio, I couldn't also say, oh, and let me sell content for Kitco, Stansberry and a few others at the same time, because there would be a conflict. And Russia is the best at figuring out, you know, how to how that leverage works in terms of building organic solidarity, which is people banding together to face a common foe. Uh, again, we talked about the U.S. being involved in 57 world conflicts. So think about how many people have been just been waiting for this moment to get away from the United States dollar. It, it reminds me of sort of the first thing you here in law school where it's sort of a metaphor where they say, if you have the facts on your side, you know, pound away with the facts. And if you have the law on your side, pound away with the law. And if you don't have the facts behind you or the law behind you, just pound on the table. And now it's gone to the fact that if you can't just pound on the table, beat the shit out of them with the, you with your guns and your, that's sort of the U S playbook is it starts off with being, you know, maybe somewhat diplomatic, and then it just turns into coercion. And what I, what's fearful, though, and frightening is, is that that's the same attitude that the state or the apparatus of the state is taking towards their own citizens. That's why they're unfurling this 50 or how many, 87,000 new IRS agents in the, um, in the Inflation Amplification Act. So it's very... Um, and that's sort of a sign. And I do want to talk a little bit about time when it comes to like, we all compare the collapse of the United States and Europe with other empires that have fallen. And the most popular one to use is Rome. And I think the mistake we all make cognitively or from a cerebral or intellectual standpoint is to think that those people back then, it was ancient. They didn't even have cars. They were stupid. But really, it's really just been a split second of time. And if you study the geological record, there's this principle called uniformitarianism. And you can learn it by just putting a garden hose in your front yard and watching erosion take place where the soils displace after maybe a day. And you'll see maybe a 16th of an inch. And then from then you can figure out, well, look at the, the depth of the Grand Canyon and look at the side of the canyon walls have these depositional layers of sediments, and that's called the, the geological record. And the earth is 4.5 billion years old. So really Rome being 2000 years ago or 2,500 years ago is really like 
a split second ago in terms of, you know, where we are on the, if you were just to take a clock, it just happened yesterday. So if you think about these tax collectors coming out and being unleashed on us, just after the virus was unleashed on us, um, it was sort of a big deal, and I'm not religious, but there were great stories in the Bible about the Pharisees getting pissed off, like, why is Jesus hanging out with the tax collectors? I mean, they were they were worse low lowlifes than the prostitutes and the criminals that he also hung out with. Um, and that's how it is now. We're going to be saying, who would take this job to be an IRS agent, you know, and actually go after your own citizens and you know how are we going to get rid of these 87,000 people we can't even get rid of the TSA workers that you know brought to us courtesy of the of the Patriot Act which you know in these layers of spending programs just never go away like tarp cares uh, chips today I was reading about a new police initiative because I just moved to Pittsburgh from Denver this week and oh my God, Biden's coming to town to unveil this new like police initiative. But you know, the IRS will just turn into this national police force. Um, and it's a good way to just to push every, actually now both, I think they won't be talking about right wing versus left wing. It'll be like, let's all stick together to face, you know, how are we gonna fight off um, the, these robocops? Anyway. So do you think that they, you know, that new provision for the IRS is basically to help pay for all the deficit spending that has happened over the last two years? Yeah, I think it's another sign of a collapse of an empire. You have, you know, look at all the verticals that are happening to kill off the middle class. You can say, I consider currency debasement or the inflation tax is a way to kill off people. The virus, a way to kill off people. It was engineered by the United States government, Eco Health Alliance, NIH, whoever, gain of function research. Everyone knows that. Then the vaccines after that. Now look at the WEF, you know, and their narrative. Um, I read recently where, you know, our government's paying farmers not to farm. What, what's that all about? You know, why would you not want farmers to farm and you'd pay them not to? Be, and then they throw that under some guise of climate emergency. And those poor people in Europe, the farmers where the WEF is, has the, you know, the political clout to have people tax them for a cow fart. I mean, have we really gone that insane or is this a, a, an effort by the ruling class to return to the days where it's a two tier system? History's always been just the king and the villagers. And it's only been since industrial revolution, you know, a very short time ago, that we saw the middle class emerge. So that's a new experiment. So it makes more sense that we will now default back to the two tier system. And I, I see all these policies as including our monetary policy in the fiat experiment and the printing of money and the unleashing of virus and the new IRS beast. And almost any other legislation can be tied back to an intentional effort to wipe out the middle class. So, John, I'd like to go back to, uh, you know, kind of a piece of the the Belt and Road Initiative that we were talking about. What role could silver play in that, you know, really the largest infrastructure project in human history? Um, that's a great opportunity for silver, um, because with that massive amount of people, you know, Eurasia, Africa, India, and Latin America will join in, in an initiative. They won't be tied to this Belt and Road or the Silk Road project, but they are connected now through the, the bridges, railroads, waterways, but digitally they have to be connected. So when we talk about connectivity through our devices, silver is still the best conductor. So short answer, through digital, Marketing, digital communications, digital media, streaming services, social media. Um, it's the way people work now. It's how we're talking now. So silver. So just an expansion of technology right. into one of that, like we were talking about, 75% of the, the world's population. 
Correct. That's just, it's, it was on tap before, um, you know, there was back when, before Facebook, Google and some, and Twitter decided to be the arbiters of truth and ban people. There was actually, they had some really good business models. Like when uh, Zuckerberg bought WhatsApp, the plan was to use, and they spent 19 billion on WhatsApp, you know, a decade ago. And people were like, whoa, you just spent 1 billion on Instagram and that paid off, but 19 billion on WhatsApp and you have no way to monetize it, but they have so many users. And the idea would be to fly drones or, you know, around Africa, let's say, and then people through WhatsApp, they could beam an internet signal to people's WhatsApp um, device or WhatsApp is the, the, the messaging platform. But so it was a satellite in space and then a drone at, you know, 15,000 feet and then boom, there's your internet, just like Musk is doing right now with his Starlink, you know, connecting people that, may get cut off from Xfinity or one of those other providers. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, kind of going back to this idea of the decline of the empire in the U S obviously we're seeing, you know, inflation, you know, supposedly starting to, to soften, but is inflation the only real tool that the fed has remaining? And, and if so, why are they acting so tough against it? They're not acting tough against it. They're they're jawboning that they're acting tough against it. They're this is the best way I can describe it. Like today, I think I saw this lady. Maybe it was yesterday, uh, Loretta Mester, um, speaking on behalf of the Fed, saying that we are going to continue to uh, raise rates to fight inflation. Um, but we're and we're data driven. It's like, well, if you're data driven, then why would you miss your two percent mandate so bad? It's like if you're the one creating the inflation, then why are you acting like it's your role to get tough on inflation? When and then I thought about it when Jerome Powell last week, it was pathetic. He was in Jackson Hole opening his pie hole saying things like, there's going to be pain, there's going to be pain. It'd be like if I'm about to get crucified and the executioner said to me, John, there's going to be pain. There's bam, bam, bam. It's like, yeah, you're the one causing the pain. It reminds me of like a little kid who's like the parents say, you know, regarding the spanking, this is going to hurt me a lot more. It's going to hurt you. And I always thought to myself, well, what an ironic thing to say. If that's the case, let me give you the spanking then. And because it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is insane to listen to these creatures that have created inflation. And let's think about when they introduced dollars to the system, what they're really doing, whether it's mouse click money or printing a bill. The only way that dollar gets its value is once it enters this large pool of money, it has to steal value from the existing dollars that are out there. So if that's their job, to print and be the you know lender and buyer of last resort, that's the only job that, and the only tool the Fed has, and they have to have inflation. And the only way a debt-based model works is to create more debt. So that's what the central bankers do. They have, they can't, are you kidding me? The Fed funds rate, what happens overnight with it? It will wreck the economy. It will, you know, and that's what I'm thinking about. Some of these terms we use all the time are just sort of like, let's not use the nomenclature that the enemy dictates us to use. Inflation is one of those words. Really, it's currency debasement. A recession is one of those words. It's wiping out the middle class. Um, so, it's also been redefined. <laughs> Oh, that's right. We learned and I figured out why that was like, why such great effort, even after two consecutive GDPs to say this is not inflation and all the people they marched out just got their ass kicked when they tried to say, I mean, there were some people that were just like, no, come on, you can't, you can't redefine, you know, green and red. Uh, yeah, that. And then where are we now? That goes back to that's one of the tricks, though, of sort of Orwellian. Um, 
Orwell talked about, you know, up is down, black is white, you know. So that's another sign of a collapsing empire when you start changing your terms around. So, John, why do you think economists get the supply-demand equation wrong when it comes to resources? Oh, geez. Because they're employed by politicians. Um, One story I can think of is, or maybe a metaphor, is if you and maybe 10 of us started a coal company and the coal was sort of close to the ground or near the surface, we would be able to harvest the coal and maybe drive it a short air, you know, uh, length to market. And it would be, the profits would be maximized and the workers would get paid well. But as you see depletion of coal, you have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper to get the same quality of coal, which means now you got heavy machinery involved and layers of supervisors and mid management. And now the markets are further away. So you have to add freight to the coal or spend money on marketing. And pretty soon there's not that much money left over for the workers to get paid. So depletion of resources can lead to um, wages being drastically reduced. And remember, in the backdrop, you also have the inflation tax robbing people of purchasing power. So as people have less and less money, they're not buying the things that um, help the price of coal. Same thing with oil in the 40s and 50s and 60s. There was the gushers. Remember those Hollywood movies where, you know, it's like, I found oil or like Jed Camp Clampett and the Beverly Hillbillies. I've, I found oil. So there aren't those gushers anymore. So now it costs more to get that oil and no one's been investing in oil because it's dirty. Oil is dirty. Coal is dirty. Um, But electricity is clean. And people forget, how do we make electricity again? You know, so this leads to demand destruction and demand destruction then brings down to where the price of coal and the price of oil are too low. And once things are too low, you, then you get more more wage disparity. And that's, you know, really the difference between cost push and demand pull inflation. And now we have both. So how does that apply to the energy problem that we're currently facing, John? Well, I'd say we're in a situation where we have the powers to be, the ones that employ the economists, feeding a false narrative where there's, They want the energy price to be higher in a sense to where their plan for alternative energy just doesn't look so unfeasible. So if we were told that that oil and gas are dirty and the new administration cancels the Keystone pipeline and and new leases and no one talks about the fact that the refineries, it's not you can have all the oil fields in the world. But here in the Mid-Atlantic, for example, they've been shutting down refineries. So we're not going to get to that. I forgot the number, 100 million barrels a day needed. Um, so the economists are just have been told the wrong problem to solve. They were told, figure out a way um, to message to the rank and file that coal and gas and oil are dirty instead of figuring out um, another problem to solve. But I did write an article on that that'll be out tomorrow on on demand, um, how a depletion of resources makes things worse. Mm-hmm. So do you think, you know, that ties into this, this verbiage and really the, the reaction of the executive branch of the U.S. government using emergency orders for what could be debated as an emergency. When when we're hearing that the verbiage of climate change and it being framed as an emergency, you know, we can, obviously there's debate about the source of it. No one probably really debates that there is some type of climate change coming, but you know these models are so complex when you actually sit down and try to look at them. And forecasting this stuff out, you know, even even ten years is 
almost impossible. So when we see that the executive branch of the U.S. government using emergency orders for this, you know, quote unquote emergency, which the right. use of the, the word emergency could be debated. Is this a red flag for an abuse of power to you? For sure. I think it goes back to um, if, you know, we just came out of COVID lockdowns. So by calling everything a climate emergency, you're going to have the unilateral way to enforce more control on people. You know, it, it's kind of like a lot of us are concerned about the central bank digital currency. It will just be another tool to in China. You see they're locking people down and they say it's for COVID, but it's absolutely because of they have energy issues. They can't. But you keep people at home. They're not going to drive around in their car. If you have an app that you can turn on and off. If you want to ride your, I know you like motorcycles. I like to travel with my family. Anything that they can, you know, use um, surveillance, control, any way to lock people down. Those are all tools to authoritarian measures. You know, pretty soon it's been tried before. People wearing a yellow star over here. Um, it's a way to, you know, when you're in school, there's or being grounded. You know, daddy's in it. We have these, they, and that's sort of the playbook. If you look at the debt market is sort of, the stock market is a derivative of the debt market. So we always have to keep an eye on the debt market first and then the stock market. So it's going to collapse, then stock market collapse. And then we'll see the money. This doesn't go away or to money heaven. It'll rotate into commodities um, like gold and silver. But not without a fight. Um, you got to remember that if the, this massive debt we're seeing with whatever excuse the Fed uses, let's take your climate emergency scenario. That's a great example of how to come up with a new emergency to print a bunch of cash that robs you of your purchasing power and also then allows the bank's only tool we said was issuing debt They're of last resort, right? They're the buyer and issuer and lender of last result, resort. But this gives them enormous power. Um, and the only way to get away from that, you know, we can talk about what the resistance might look like. It's frightening to be a part of it. Um, but the best way to do it, if you see the train coming to you, is to first get off the track and then to probably interact with all of us are sort of like minded. We're going to debate over you know, the price action of silver and gold and other sort of wedge issues. But I think we all see that it's not good to let to be controlled by the government. And as they, you know, control is sort of the modus operandi, whether they use military or financial tools like debt, debt traps, um, digital currencies that are that have facial recognition and other biometrics. And it's getting pretty damn dystopian out there, don't you think, Tom? Yeah, I mean, it depends how much time you you really spend looking at this stuff, and then how 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 normalized in some ways that all of these different pieces of the puzzle have become. Right? If you look at if you try to take a step back and look at the last two and a half years, we've constantly had this. I don't know what what exactly the right term would be for it. It's like a a shock and awe strategy. I would say right. maybe where you you're presented with something that's very shocking and then it's walked back to maybe 30 percent of the initial shock factor well relative to that first shock factor it seems much more palatable to only have you know 30 percent control versus that 100 percent that was originally presented to you right but, and i mean having all these different conversations on the show obviously i'm more aware of this stuff than i would say most like your average person is, but, you know, in aggregate, putting all these pieces together, it's, it's hard to say that there is any other way to, to look at it. Right. I mean, it's, whenever there's a pattern, you can pretty much say, and I, by the way, that's the first time I heard someone explain, I kind of like the way you're saying that they kind of come with some exaggerated form 
of the restrictive or the repressive policy and then they walk it back. And that keeps us all sort of like this all the time where you're, are they going to pivot? Oh, shoot. You know, you're always in this, what they call a psychologist would call that fight or flight. You're in that mode all the time, Mm -hmm. which actually is really bad for your heart. And, you know, just, you're always in this adrenaline moment. It's funny because I listen to, you know, podcasts and E.B. Tucker will say, he'll come on and say, what, they'll ask him a technical question. He says, you need just to go and sit in a hot tub in New Mexico near Ojo Caliente. You know, that was his advice for someone last week. And I thought it was brilliant because sometimes you just cannot pivot from this narrative to narrative to narrative. And I think a lot of it has to do with there is what they call pluralism quite a bit of competition for who gets to be the ruling class or have the dominant news story of the 24 hour uh, cycle that day. It's not just the Republicans or the Democrats or Europe versus the United States, NATO versus BRICS, all those sorts of um, competing forces. It could be a religious group that day. It could be um, a corporation, you know, that, It could be, you know, and then you'll see on Twitter the things that are trending in the upper right hand corner. And it's always, you know, 180 degrees from the truth. It's especially the fact checkers credentials don't have to be explained. Right. Right. And that's sort of a new phenomenon, too, recently of, you know, fact checkers, fact checkers say you'll see like kind of a story you believe in. And then it's the opposite of that. And then it's always ended by fact checker, fact checkers say. It's like, who are these, you know, um, phantom fact checkers, you know, and it's so weird to have that sort of title. It'd be like the thought police say, you know, it's just, I don't want someone thinking for me. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, it's, it reminds me of a conversation that I had with Chris Irons, quote the Raven, exactly along these lines of, you know, talking about who the new arbiters of truth are and, you know, just the ability to access this information and and evaluate it for yourself instead of having somebody else tell you how to think about it. Yeah. Who wants, I don't want anyone to curate my media for me. Mm -hmm. I have a brain in my skull. I have the ability, it's called discernment to sort of make these sorts of choices. And I think we want that of an informed population. You want them to be thinking, not just spoon fed or fist fed the talking points of the day. And it's and it sort of comes down to distractibility, you know, which is we talked last time I was on your show about bread and circuses. If everyone is so distracted that we live in this soundbite world that who can get off the zinger that day? And it's almost like the political debates were like, ooh, he got off a zinger and look at his ratings went up 10 points. But it's like, what about the substance or his platform or any of the other things or his resume? No, it's the zinger that matters, everyone, the zinger. Mm-hmm. I mean, we got to get out of a soundbite world. So, John, you know, maybe give our audience some tips on where, let's say, you curate your, your information diet and, and how important that is to you. Um, I think, you know, there's many ways to gather research and I, I think they should be local too. I think as we see um, this huge effort with the, you know, if we weren't worried enough about being, having the state as being our enemies, then we have to worry about some non-government organization like the WEF. You know, there's too many things to worry about. So what we have to do is be proactive, get yourself out of the system and find a community. Um You know, I think sometimes I have to admit I'm a member of Wall Street Silver and love to see the apes post their content. uh, And they did a great job of gathering those like minded people that believe in sound and hard money values. But what if the next level would be, you know, plugging in your zip code and then you find 50 people in your town that have those values that you could almost like a church of some kind. Um, because you need those sorts of supports to to fight for mental health and a little bit of self-care, if I can sound so PC. Um, otherwise, you're, the gaslighting, I think when you talked about that, your, your, your analysis of coming out and then walking things back, that's sort of that gaslighting that 
I think we're all starting to, we're fatigued from it. I don't you think? Mm -hmm. I think that's so. Well, let me finish. Sometimes I get off on these long-winded answers that I forgot your question. I'm, I apologize. But just about speaking about of Chris <laughs> Irons, he did the same thing. He was riffing, and he goes, "What were we talking about?" So I'm in good company. Absolutely. What was the question? Um, just how you curate your information diet. Okay. You know, yeah. What, what some curate, of your some of your let's say best sources of information? Uh, Twitter, Reddit, and then um, local. Not local news, but local independent news. So that would be like in every city has an alternative news magazine. And there's what's called the Association of, of News Weeklies in Pittsburgh here. It's called City Paper. I was just in Denver. It's called the Westward. I worked in Albuquerque for the Weekly Alibi. I used to work for the Onion newspaper. Um, and that was sort of you want to find people that are counterculture because they're not they're already leaning towards distrust towards the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's you know, my number one tip for curating news is find where there's sort of um, I, I call it living in a parallel universe. So you got the the normies out there or the mainstream and it's OK. You got to you have one foot in the mainstream, but then you have to be intellectually curious about uh, and also be open to who, you know, opposing views. One thing that I see a lot of people bashing on something like Marxism, it's like Karl Marx was a historian. Then some nefarious, pernicious folk took his writings and created the Communist Party. It had nothing to do with Marx. That was Lenin and Stalin and other, you know, sociopaths taking the works of Marx. But the good thing about embracing someone that may have an opposing thought to you is you can, Marx is the one that sort of took Hegel's dialectics of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And that's kind of what we see the whole history of the world moves in. There's a regime, then there's a rising up, you know, like we saw with the French Revolution or the, the U.S. Revolution. And now we're seeing, you know, that now the, the ruling class is acting a lot like the British did. So we're going to see this sort of who's going to replace, you know, what I call the neocons, the Bidens and the both sides of the aisle. They're buying and selling stocks after intelligence briefings. Um, Unusual Wales does a great job of documenting these trades. And that's when you see the money going to Ukraine. Um, that that's just and then they buy Lockheed Martin at the same time. We saw Nancy Pelosi take her son over to Taiwan when we were at, like close to, you know, these are you don't want to agitate nations like China that are well armed or Russia and, you know, Hunter Biden selling oil to Ukraine and China and releasing the strategic reserves. You know, what is that? That's just it, the corruptions on full on display for everyone to see. And that's another sign of, the, of, of an empire collapsing. Mm -hmm. I wrote an article called um, in the final act of the play, um, the actors removed their costumes. That, that just means they're not even hiding it anymore. Like when Nixon was around and it was Nixon, Halderman, Ehrlichman and, and that crew, all they did was like bugs their opponents in and, and the Watergate Hotel. That wouldn't even make the news cycle today. Not at all. That is, would not even be a controversy. They'd be like, boy, that's pretty Boy Scout amateur hour. You need to step up your game if you're going to topple over your enemy, right? I mean, at least poison them or something. Well, John, I think that's a decent place to wrap up today's conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, let's let's end with that. Let's poison them, you know, since that's what's happening. I like that as an ending note. Um, there's nothing else to add. I really um, just want to tell everyone that let's all – stick together to fight uh, our enemy, um, go to my website, hit me up with a message. I return all my emails because it's only through networking um, that we're going to be able to live in that parallel universe to fight the enemy, which is the state. They're trying to kill you. I appreciate all your articles and research too, John. Of course, your website is thepickaxe.xyz and on Twitter at the pickaxe underscore AG. John, thanks so much for your time today. Peace. 
This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.